So for a lot of you, this whole cyber business is sort of a new thing. Uh, I understand that within this organization it's been a focus only for the last couple of years. What you need to know is that it has been in fact embedded in the system since the dawn of the internet. This is nothing new. Back in 1967, 50 years ago, when the ARPANET, which was the Pentagon precursor to the internet, was about to roll out, there was a man named Willis Ware. Willis Ware was the head of the computer department at the RAND Corporation. He was on the scientific advisory board of the National Security Agency. He'd worked with von Neumann on the first electronic computers. And he wrote a, a paper. It was secret at the time, but it's been declassified since. It's, it'd be worth your while to go take a look at it. It's very interesting. And he said, look, I understand this business about putting information on a network. Obviously, great idea. It's amazing that you've been able to do it. But you need to understand something that once information is put on a network, once it ha you can get access from multiple unsecured locations, you're creating inherent vulnerabilities. You're not going to be able to keep secrets anymore. And when I was researching this book, Dark Territory, I went to the guy who was the deputy director of ARPA at the time, which created the ARPANET, and I said, were you familiar with Willis Ware's paper? And he goes, oh yeah, sure, I knew Willis. And I said, well, what'd you think? And he said, well, I took it to my team, and I talked with a couple members of the team who confirmed this story, and they read it, and they said, oh, God, don't, don't saddle us with a security requirement, too. Look, look how hard it was just to do what we've done. Let's take this one step at a time. It would, it would be like asking the Wright brothers that their first plane has to carry 20 passengers 50 miles. Let, let's take this one step at a time, the Russians aren't going to have anything like this for decades anyway. And which, you know, it's true. They didn't have anything like this for two or three decades. But by that time, whole networks and systems had grown up with no provision for security whatsoever. This is sort of like the, the, the bitten apple in the digital Garden of Eden. It was embedded in the nature of the system that was designed. Okay, so... Nothing happens about this for a while. Uh, you know, nobody's, very few people have heard of computers in 1967. The next thing that, where this issue prop, crops up is in June of 1983, when President Ronald Reagan is having one of his five-day weekends in Camp David, and he watches movies every night. And on that Saturday night, he watches a new movie called War Games. You're, you've probably all seen War Games. Uh, for the few who haven't, Matthew Broderick plays this tech whiz teenager who gloms onto what he thinks is a new computer game called Global Thermonuclear War. In fact, he's, he's dialed in to the NORAD central computer, and by playing this game, he almost triggers World War III. So the following Wednesday, Reagan is back in the White House, and there's a meeting of his national security advisors and some people from the Hill. It, it wasn't about this. It was about something else completely. But he can't get this movie out of his mind. And at one point, he puts down his index cards, and he says, has anybody seen this movie, War Games? Well, it had just come out the previous Friday. Nobody had seen this movie. So he, he launches into this very detailed plot description, and people are sort of looking around, wondering what's going on here. Where's this guy going with this? And then uh, he turns to the ge general, he turns to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Gen General John Vesey, and he says, General, could, could something like this really happen? Could, could someone just break into our most valuable computer? And Vesey says, I'll look into that, Mr. President. And he comes back a week later and he says, Mr. President, the problem is much worse than you think. And this leads, about 10 months later, to the signing of the first presidential decision directive on computer security. It's, it's called NSDD 145. It's declassified now. You can look it up. It's very interesting. It's written in 1984. And what you'll find most interesting about this document, which is written now 33 years ago, is that it reads very similarly to the kinds of documents that you read all the time now. Our computer systems are becoming vulnerable to electronic interference. This could be manipulated by foreign agents, terrorists, and criminals. And it comes up with a solution. The solution 
Because basically, th th this document was, was written by people in the National Security Agency. They were the only ones who knew about this kind of stuff. And they knew about this stuff because they, in fact, were making other governments' computers vulnerable through various kinds of hacking and intrusion. That's what the NSA does. So they knew that at some point, it could come back to us. This isn't rocket science, you know. So uh, this, this, this decision directive, it basically the solution was to put to make all security requirements for all computers in the United States, government, business, military, everything, under the purview of the NSA. Well, there were some people on Capitol Hill who didn't much like that. You know, the NSA is supposed to just look at foreign intelligence. It's not supposed to have any role domestically. And so they struck a compromise where basically the NSA would be in charge of dot mil, you know, all classified stuff with the military, of securing that. And the Commerce Department would be in charge of all else. Well, this didn't go anywhere because at the time, the NSA wasn't interested in securing computers or computer networks. If they found a hole, some kind of gap, they would exploit it. They were going to patch a gap. They, they, they could get in and, and get intelligence information. Commerce Department, they didn't have the, the personnel, the technical know-how. They, they didn't know what to do with this directive. So things went on for another decade where nothing happened. A big turning point was in 1995 with the Oklahoma City bombing. And President Clinton formed a presidential commission to look into the vulnerability of federal facilities and, and other kinds of facilities and, and what we should do about it. Well, some people got onto this commission who were members of the NSA and other dark elements of the intelligence community who'd been trying to work on this cyber program. And in fact, just about this time, it was called cyber. It started then because somebody on the commission had read William Gibson's novel. And so, you know, cyber. So uh, they decided, well, this is an opportunity to make this about cyber vulnerability. Everybody thought this was going to be about, you know, vulnerability of nuclear power plants or something. The report comes out, more than half the report is talking about cyber vulnerability, which nobody had even heard of. So this is 1996. And the thing that they talked about the most was the vulnerability of what they called critical infrastructure. And this included uh, a lot of things, transportation, power, electrical power, and of course it also included banking and financing. That was where it first entered in. Now, the interesting thing, when this commission was holding hearings with various executives of the major corporations and utilities, they found that these people didn't know anything about this. They, they were starting to plug into the internet. What a great idea. We put everything on the internet. It all runs from spy sensors. You know, with the power companies, you know, there's a shortage over here in the grid, and there's a surplus over there. The computer will detect this and automatically transfer the electrical energy. Electrical transmission of, of uh, bank transfers. So it's great. But of course, it also left open these vulnerabilities. And the commissioners found that when they questioned executives about this, they would say, well, what are you doing about vulnerability? These people had no idea what they were talking about. They were thinking, you mean you know, against, against bank robbers or against people who climb over our fence. Or, they had no idea that they were getting into what Willis Ware had said in 1967 was an arrangement, a system that would create inherent vulnerabilities. Okay, so that's 1995. Yeah, at that time, there were some people who really got into this. In the Clinton White House, they wanted to uh, do things like uh, creating a separate parallel internet first for government agencies and then for critical infrastructure that would be wired into a government agency and if there was an attack, the agency would detect this and do something about it right away. Well, this leaked out. It was denounced as Orwellian and it vanished. It was never brought up again. Uh, one thing that you should know about your own industries and, and, and others in the critical infrastructure they also, Clinton administration also tried to come up with the idea of, of mandatory security requirements for critical infrastructure companies. In other words, creating things that they had to do to keep their networks secure. Well, this was vociferously lobbied against. 
Even within the administration, the Secretary of Commerce, the White House economic advisor, thought that any kind of regulations would put a damper on uh, these industries' competitiveness. And so that disappeared as well. What came up instead was something which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, is the ISACs, Information Security and Analysis Center, where supposedly, you know, your IT officers or whatever would, would share, uh, you know, best, best policies, best practices for how to deal with these problems. They could get information to some extent from the government on how to deal with it. And for some industries, this actually worked very well, one of the chief of which being banking and finance. Now, that might surprise you because, you know, I know and you know that, that banks are, that there's a, a hacking attempt on banks, you know, thousands of times a day for, for each one of you. So, but you guys are actually doing uh, some of the best in, in, in the whole industry. Uh, you really do share information. Well, but why is this? Why is this? Well, what, what is a, a bank's function? You know, they want your money and they need your trust. If you're reading in the newspaper that your bank just gets, gets hacked and it's losing $10 million a week, people are going to take money out of that bank and put it someplace else. And you also have a lot of money. You could actually hire people who are very good at, at dealing with these problems. And, and if, okay, you can't really uh, disrupt the hacking, but you can detect it and you can do something about it. You can expel the hackers. You can, you can repair the damage and so forth pretty quickly. Other parts of the critical infrastructure industries, for example, electrical power, you know, they, they use joining the ISAC the way that some people do, you know, joining the gym. You know, hey, I joined the gym, I, I, I have to go exercise too? You know, I'm paying my dues, isn't that good enough? Well, I, I'm in the ISAC. It was an excuse for really not doing anything. Even though there were a lot of experiments around this time showing that power generators were extremely vulnerable. To, to electronic interference. And if you don't believe that, you should go to YouTube and look up something called the Aurora Power Generator Test, which shows basically an enormous generator going up in smoke uh, entirely through computer uh, manipulations in, in about 2007. So what are the implications of this? Well, again, uh, you cannot keep people out. This was Willis Ware's great insight in 1995, uh, I mean in 1970, 77, 76, that, uh, 67, sorry, 67, that it's inherent. It's part of the problem. And so what do you do? Well, in the Pentagon, the past few years, there, there was a Defense Science Board study uh, in 2013 which looked into cybersecurity. Now this is the Pentagon. The Pentagon operate, the military operates on a separate net called the mill net. And they've whittled it down so there are only about eight points of intersection between the mill net and the commercial internet. And because the NSA is part of the military, they can actually sit on those intersections. So they have pretty good security. And yet, every time, every time, there's been a war game where part of the game is the red team tries to hack into the command control network of the blue team, they always get in. They always get in. It's gotten to the point where the Navy has, dis has started training officers on ships to navigate again with the sextant, to navigate by the stars with the sextant, like they did in days of yore. Because, not just in case, but because they recognize that at some point in a war, the enemy is going to hack into the data link between the ship's command and the GPS satellites, and at that point, the guys on the ships aren't going to know where they are, much less to ensure whether the missiles, which are guided by GPS signals and so forth, are accurate and so forth. So, and this is the military. So basically, this report in 2013 uh, talked about the inherent fragility of our architecture. The inherent fragility. And that's the Defense Department, which, which has a much less fragile architecture than your industries, your companies do. And so they, what the, the, the buzzwords in the Pentagon now, and maybe in some of your companies as well, is, is deterrence, detection, and resilience. 
Now deterrence, they, they don't really know what that means. Nobody has defined deterrence. I mean, you know, if, if, first of all, to, to deter somebody from an attack, you have to figure out, well, what, do we, what kind of attack are we trying to deter? From the government's point of view, uh, does it matter if, if, if one bank is hacked? Is that in, is something that the government should be responsible for? What about six banks? What about 12 banks? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think five years ago, ten years ago, if you would have asked, nobody would have predicted that the first time that a president of the United States issued, you know, went on TV, uh, announced that it, there had been a hack, and said that the United States would retaliate in a way in a time of our choosing. I don't think anybody would have guessed that that would have been in response to a hack of Sony Entertainment for a movie that insulted the leader of North Korea. It was at that point that a lot of companies said, wow, I guess maybe we should start getting interested in this cyber thing. Sony had been hacked three times before, you know, that their, their PlayStation 3 and so forth. But Sony Entertainment, the studio, they had said, we, we don't need to pay any attention to this. Who's going to hack into our uh, stuff? We don't have money here. We don't have anything like that. And, you know, there, then there came another thing, so, something that's been ignored because uh, the Sony hack sort of blotted out the app, blotted out all the, uh, the wavelengths on this. Uh, there was a, a casino here in Las Vegas, Sands Resorts, uh, owned by Sheldon Adelson, who had said at a conference while the Iran nuclear talks were going on, that we should drop an atom bomb in the middle of the desert to show the Iranians that we need business if they don't, you know, negotiate a treaty that really hurts them. As a result of which, the Iran government decided to hack into Adelson's casino and resort. It took them a few weeks to find the vulnerabilities. They found it. Now, if you're hacking into a casino, I mean, you can get a lot of money. They weren't interested in money. They were interested in making a, a political statement. So they wiped out all of their hard drives and then put up on the screens political statements, like it is a crime to threaten the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, I mean, they got into everything. They got into what, what in the casino traders called the big whales, the, the big spenders, social security numbers, credit card numbers. But they're making a political statement. That's when everybody realized that this cyber thing is about, it's covering the gamut. Everything is now hooked up to computers. Everything is wired. This was, you know, and now, you know, we, we've got Internet of Things, the, the kind of unthinking act of convenience that uh, enveloped all of critical infrastructure, we're now bringing into our homes. Everything, you can get, you know, a refrigerator that automatically detects whether you're low on milk. And if you are, it'll order some more milk from Fresh Direct or whatever delivery service you have in your town. This is great. I mean, on the one hand, this is great. Why, we're all so busy. Why should we have to worry about whether there's enough milk in the refrigerator? This, in fact, is the, is the Jetsons' fantasy of, of what this was going to be like. We don't have to worry about the day-to-day you know, the mundanities of life. A computer will run all of this. The problem is it, it's hooked up to sensors. It's hooked up to networks. It's trivially vulnerable. Now, back in the mid-90s, there was a guy who wrote an essay called Information Terrorism, Can You Trust Your Toaster? He was kind of kidding, but that has come to be. And one thing that even he didn't realize, it was a guy named Matt DeVoe, he didn't realize this, that what... what the big danger of IoT, which we're only now beginning to understand, is not that, you know, somebody will hack into your smart home and turn up the heat or make the stereo go on at 3 o'clock in the morning. Okay, that's... It's that they can amass all of the... Uh, they, they, they can recruit everything that's in your house as digital bots for a much larger attack on something else. This happened with, with Dyn. Uh, a couple of years ago, where they basically amassed all the digital horsepower, so to speak, from about a couple hundred thousand IoT devices, and then used them. They all sent out signals. Who knew that your toaster can send out a signal? Well, I can. They all sent out a signal to one other network and overloaded it in a DDoS. So basically, we are 
for the sake of convenience and just general kind of technical cool, sort of uh, giving bad guys the rope w with which to hang us. So, you know, it, it's not just money laundering, it's, it's, it's laundering of, of everything. We are all, all, we have bots in our house that we don't even know. So what are some things that we can do about this? Well, I mean, in the case of just banks and things like that, I mean, look, you can't keep people out, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't build better locks and better alarms. You know, most, most, most cyber criminals, it's like during the Cold War, Senator Henry Jackson, uh, he, he, he likened the Russians to a, um, a, uh, a hotel thief. You know, tries out one door, goes to the next door. If it's locked, goes to the next door. He'll go to the one that's unlocked. That, that's what most of these guys are like. So, you know, if, if, you, if you do certain things of, of digital hygiene, you're probably okay. Uh, but if somebody really wants to get into your stuff, if you have something they want and they really want to get in, and especially if they're a nation state with the resources and wherewithal, they're going to get in. So again, the real thing is detection and resilience. Detection, make sure you know that someone's in there. Right now, the average time that a hacker is inside an industrial network before the hacker is detected is seven months. You get a lot of stuff in seven months. And resilience, programs to, uh, to uh, you know, rebuild to kick out the intruder and rebuild. And also, you know, maybe a little bit of, of discrimination. Uh, you can't protect everything. So figure out what, is, what are really the two or three things that are vitally important. Vitally important, without which you're gonna be in a lot of trouble that you need for, for basic operations. And really protect those. And take that stuff off the, the line if you possibly can. Although, you know, there's kind of a myth of the air gap, too. For, for example, I'm very much in favor of going back to paper ballots in our elections. You know, when I was a kid, my mother was in the League of Women Voters, and she, went, she was counting ballots. And yeah, maybe you don't know who the president is till the next morning. But, you know, it's better that than to have foreign, foreign intelligence organizations hacking into our, into our election. I mean, there are people who set up election machines, just as I'm sure there are people who set up automatic systems in banks, elect, uh, power companies and so forth, that have no idea what is made of these things. You know, what, 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 how, you, how they work, how they operate. And they're leaving themselves wide open to, to catastrophe. Uh, one other thing, back, go back to, to war games for a minute. And, and then I'll, I'll leave it and we can have some questions. Uh, Willis Ware, the guy who, who wrote that paper back in 1967, when the writers of War Games were working on their script, these two young guys who, by the way, also wrote Sneakers later, which also had a major impact on U.S. security policy, which you'll have to read my book to, to figure out what that's about. But they, they, they were writing the script and they wanted it to have some plaus you know, some basic plausibility. And they were thinking, well, you know, that this NORAD computer, can it, could it, could, is it plausible that a kid could just um, dial up and get into it? Isn't it a closed system? And they wanted to look into this. They lived in Santa Monica. It's very close to the RAND Corporation. They called the public affairs office and they explained what they wanted. And they, was there anybody there that they could talk to? And he said, oh yeah, you want to talk to Willis Ware. So they went and talked to Willis Ware, who turned out to be this very nice guy, looked kind of like Jiminy Cricket, had an easy laugh, very easy going. And he said, yeah, yeah, you know, it's a funny thing, I designed the, the software for that computer, the real one in the movie. So he goes, yeah, you're right, it, it is a closed system, but, but you know, there's always an officer who wants to do some work at home on the weekends. Maybe this sounds familiar to some of you. So, so they leave a port open. So yeah, I guess if the kid just happened to dial that number to get into the port, yeah, I guess he could, I guess he could uh, get in. And then he'd kind of lean forward and he goes, you know, here, here's the secret that people don't, don't understand. Um, the only computer 
that's completely secure is a computer that no one can use. So that's the real lesson. So all of your computers are never going to be completely secure. Those of you who are getting into the cyber aspect of this, I mean, in a way, the future looks pretty. You know, you are never going to be, it's, they will find the cure to cancer, they will colonize Mars, uh, they will be able to teleport you from here to the colony on Mars, and there will still be problems with the vulnerability of computer networks. So you're going to be around for quite a while, unless some catastrophe happens and somebody decides just to tear up the whole system and start all over again, and then they'll need people like you to, uh, to tell them what went wrong with the original and how to do it better. Thanks very much. Dr. Marvin there. Thank you, Fred. Um, you know, we've had various speakers uh, and increasingly more on this topic of cybersecurity and cybercrime. And uh, one of the, one of, I, I, I can think back to a keynote several years ago uh, in which there was an argument for really limited government involvement with private industry. And there's, there's um, a lot of privacy concerns, certainly, on the part of industry. Um, but then you highlight that the attacks on private industry are often from nation states. So I, I kind of want you to ruminate a little bit on, you know, who should be uh, protecting us? Who is protecting us now? Who should be protecting us? What's the kind of uh, need for uh, interaction between industry, government, and what's the proper balance? Uh, you know, in your book, you point out the NSA, which has a major responsibility, um, likes to find flaws in software that they don't necessarily want to report because yeah. uh, uh, they use them to, for espionage purposes on... on well, they're others. getting, they're getting so better ahead. at that now. Yeah. Uh, they now have pretty s strict regulations on... Uh, they have to go through a process. If they find a, a, a flaw and decide, okay, do we exploit it or patch it, they have to ask a series of about a dozen questions. And it has to go through the NSC, not just the NSA, National Security Council, on whether or not they are allowed to exploit this, and if so, for how long. But no, it, this is a big dilemma. I mean, uh, technically, uh, the, the government agency in charge of protecting us is the Department of Homeland Security. But as any of you who have dealt with the Homeland Security Department know, that's kind of a joke. I mean, it, it's, they're getting better at this, but it's still a, a dysfunctional organization. It was probably a mistake to create it in the first place. You know, just putting 22 agencies from eight different departments and putting it under one roof, ensuring that all but maybe two or three topics will get completely subsumed in, in the bureaucracy with uh, buried under sand with, with no way out whatsoever. I mean, it is a dilemma. I mean, the, the, the organization that would be best at dealing with this is, uh, is the NSA. But I don't, you know, I don't want the NSA poking around in, in what I'm doing. There, there, there was a... Um, there was a plan a while back to have Homeland Security and NSA kind of sharing some resources, where in the event of a massive attack on civilian infrastructure, uh, the, you could use the, the technology of the NSA with the legal authority of DHS. But this got bogged down in just bureaucratic politics that were just uh, insuperable. So no, we, we are, you know, again, 50 years into Willis Ware's warnings, we are, we're still like in 1947 in the nuclear age. And uh, we, we, we'll, uh, we'll try to give somewhere on the program uh, equal time to our friends from Homeland Security. <laughs> uh, but... Um, they're getting me, much me, better. They're that getting much better. That was, but uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you, um, you know, the U.S. led in all this technology. We were, we were far ahead. Um, but where are we now? Are we sort of behind China? Are we behind Russia? We, we have some, I think you pointed out, some real uh, disadvantages that we have an open society and they don't. And, but yeah. where, where are we? Well, I, I mean, we're, we're ahead. We're ahead. But, but, but in one sense, we're ahead. We have the biggest rocks. We have the, 
the best curveballs. We, we could do more damage than anybody. But we also live in the glassiest house, which means that powers or bad guys with much smaller and less agile rocks can do a lot of damage because so much of where we live uh, is vulnerable. So that, that's, that's kind of the... Uh, and so, you know, but the, the problem with securing anything, where we tend to be going and what things like Cyber Command are doing is they've said, okay, the best defense is a good offense. So what's Cyber Command so the people... Oh, well, Cyber Command was set up in 2010 uh, as a way to coordinate, to infuse cyber weapons into the combatant commands all over the world. You know, CENTCOM, uh, UCOM, all of the commands to get, okay, we don't, you don't need to blow up targets, you can damage them through cyber means. So they get, and it was directed, the commander was the same four star who is the director of the NSA. That's probably going to split at this point. But basically the rationale, and this is kind of interesting too, is okay, look, uh, the best offense is a good defense. We need to get inside other countries' networks to find out what they're doing. Forward, forward defense, sometimes called active defense. Uh, you know, Countries have spies that get inside foreign governments. This is a digital spy that gets into the network. The distinction and the danger is that this would be as if your foreign spy had a mini nuke in his backpack because the difference between for active defense and offense is just one more push of a button. You're already in. It's the same technology. It's the same personnel. It's the same bag of tricks. And if we're in their networks, and they're in our networks, and it might be all for the most defensive of rationales, one push of the button and you can change that into an offense, which means that in a crisis, you create incentives for preemption. I've got to knock out this guy's cyber stuff networks before he knocks out mine. And I'm already in there. So it's not even like launching a, a missile but it should take a half an hour to get there. This, this is speed of lightning stuff. So we're all living in this kind of um, dark territory, as one might say, where we're, we're running around w with, without any constraints. One might say that. One might say that. Uh, do I have time to say where that, where that title came from? Sure, yeah. Okay. We've got a couple minutes. I was looking for a title. I've written five books, and I've always thought, well, the title will emerge in my notes, and it never does. But in this case, I was going back over my notes, and Robert Gates, who was Secretary of Defense, uh, told me that when he first became SecDef, and he was getting briefed every day about cyber attacks, you know, in defense industries, in the Pentagon, whatever. And he, he approached some of his uh, aides and he goes, you know, we've got to get together with, with the other major cyber powers and create some rules of the road. You know, like, you know, we don't, we don't attack this kind of target. He goes, even in the darkest days of the Cold War, there were always rules between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. For example, we don't kill each other's spies. You know, stuff like that. We've got to do something like that. And then he said because we are wandering in dark territory here. So I say, wow, that, that's the title of my book. But then I decide, well, I better Google this to see if it doesn't mean something, you know, obscene. So I Google dark territory, and it turns out that dark territory is a phrase from the early North American railroad industry to indicate stretches of railroad tracks that were ungoverned by signals. And I'm thinking, wow, that, what a powerful metaphor for what the internet is. So I sent Gates an email and I said, did you know this? And he said, oh yeah, sure, my grandfather was a station master on the Santa Fe Railroad for 50 years. We talked railroad terminology all the time. So that's where we are. We are wandering in dark territory and we don't know who the engineers are. The, the damaging trains on these ungoverned tracks are invisible and yet they can do a lot more damage because the stretches of track that they're controlling, our, you know, our entire societies are plugged into them. Everything is riding on these, on these rails. So one of the things that you talk about in the book um, is how each, beginning with the Reagan administration, each administration has uh, started an initiative, in some way addressed this mm -hmm. cybersecurity issue. Um, where is the Trump administration? Is there uh, an issue because of the, the you know, the, the 
reticence, let's say, to deal with uh, the election hacking uh, issue. Are we are we moving forward, or is there uh -huh. is there or you is know, we the security state continue no matter what, or what? We, we could we could be at a convention dealing with any number of subjects, and if you ask me, where are we with the Trump administration? The answer would be kind of the same, which was beats me. Uh, you might remember that Trump was going to set up a 60-day commission to look into cyber security. Rudy Giuliani was going to be the head of this. I haven't heard anything about it since. But you're right. Every administration kind of slowly comes, oh, God, yeah, this is a problem. And they have a commission, and they put out a report which reads stunningly like the report that was written by the last administration. So, no, I don't, I don't think, I, again, there might be something going on that, that I don't know about, but I, I haven't heard about anything studying. And I think what needs to happen is a commission to examine all the reports that previous administrations had written and put together the best, because some of them had some very interesting uh, uh, recommendations, which, which nobody has ever done anything about. We're, we're almost out of time. Uh, is there anything you can say about... Um threats out there that, you know, that are the nightmare threats that are going to be new that you can anticipate uh, that with, with new technologies or whatever? Well, I, I, don't, I think it's pretty much the same threats that have been there from the beginning. I mean, the big one is, uh, of course, electrical power. Uh, it's still Infrastructure attacks. Infrastructure attacks. I mean, these... Uh, yes, the industries have done things to, to make things better, but the offense has made things better too. It's, it's an arms race and it's not a very active arms race. I mean, it's, it's, the, the net effect is pretty much the same, which is that the offense does have an advantage in this game. Uh, the defense has to cover everything. The offense only has to find one way in, only has to find, you know, in some cases, one person to, to click on that, that fishing expedition. Uh, so, no, it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem, and we're all, you know, sort of uh, uh, whistling, whistling on the dark. We're whistling in the dark. Cause we, yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Fred. I, I wanted to point out Fred is going to be here uh, through noon or so, and during the break he'll be at the uh, ACAMS booth if anyone would like to ask him some questions, and if you see him, uh, he's more than open to taking questions. Uh, so we're, we're grateful for that. And I think we're very grateful for this, uh, the, this time you spent with us. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you.